We are back on Taking Care of Business on Current Radio News Talk, 1180, 1230, KGEO, 1410, KERI, 1000, KKIM in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and now on the Internet on KNookMedium.com. Our guest by phone, Dr. Larry Kawa, talking about Obamacare and his lawsuit. So, Doctor, with your lawsuit, the reason you have standing is basically because you spent X amount of money on attorney fees and time and everything, and you know you have what a hundred plus hours that you've met and with insurance getting agents. his business into compliance. Well, getting his business yep. in, but there's an actual expense. There. Yes, that's right. Right. So you're basically suing them for not uh, coming up with with Obamacare, not trying to stop it. You're suing them for not doing it. Uh, you know, Ulysses S. Grant said it best when he said the best way to repeal a bad law is to enforce it vigorously. Exactly. And that's exactly what we're doing is enforcing it vigorously. So for those on the left that would say that I'm, obst- I'm an obstructionist, I would say I'm the one that wants to enforce the law. The president has tried 16 times, successfully so, to uh, to stand in its way. Which one of us is the obstructionist? Well, I guess my question would be, when you when you sue the government, they have unlimited funds. And if they do need more, they just go and print it. But where are, your, where are your funds coming from? I'm represented by Judicial Watch, and I actually have very much the same team of lawyers that impeached Bill Clinton. Oh, uh, great. So I, and they're taking the case pro bono. So uh, you know, I'm, I'm in good shape on the financial end, and I'm not asking anyone for contributions or donations. I do have a website. There's no contribute button on it. It's theamerican.net. So if your listeners want to check out theamerican.net. Be American, you'll, uh, B-E. B-E. The, oh. Correct. T-H-E, theamerican.net. Okay. You'll see more about what we're doing. And if you want to see the specifics of the case going back and forth, I would go to judicialwatch.org. There are some great articles on Judicial Watch about this. Now, you mentioned something about a- another website you have, stateoftheunion.com. Tell us about that. I, I, have, I have a website called thestateoftheunion.com. I actually own many dona- domain names. Uh, surprisingly, you would think that uh, they would have been taken and, uh, you know, I, I don't have many that I've launched, uh, although I do own almost 4,000 of them. Wow. Uh, I just launched the, the state of the union dot com, and no hyphens, no typo squatting, just the real deal. And if your listeners go on Google right now, you'll see that we do come up first. And there's a 12-minute video of me giving what I believe is the most accurate version of where we are in terms of the state of the union as it exists currently because, of course, it's the job of the president to, uh, to describe under Article 2 the State of the Union. The reason they have it is to make sure that the president shall meet from time to time with Congress to give him information on the State of the Union so that he can s- submit to them, he can request, request their consideration for those matters that he se- feels are necessary and expedient. That's what it says in the Constitution. However, in no way has he used it for that purpose. He's basically using it as a bully pulpit. And in foreign nations that are monarchies, they have a similar address called the Speech from the Throne each year. And I feel that more and more this is a speech from the throne as he publicly lambastes our nine Supreme Court justices and claims that there are no earmarks in a bill like the Stimulus Act, which has over 9,000 earmarks. It's really just become a, a mechanism for propaganda. Well, you might remember uh, a legislator named Joe Wilson at one of the uh, I do. <laughs> one of the uh, State of the Union messages yelled out, "He lies." Well, it, it turns out I don't that agree with having done that. By the way, I think we need to respect the uh, office of the president, and that was wrong. Uh, however, Joe Wilson was correct factually, just not socially. He did lie. There were over nine thousand earmarks in a bill that the president claimed that there were none in, and I guess his, uh, you know, the, the honest part of him. Got, got better control of him, and unfortunately, he couldn't help but scream it out. You know, it's really, uh, that was unfortunate that he screamed it out, but it turned out to be true, uh, and it continues to be true. And then there was a book that came out recently by the former Secretary of Defense. I guess uh, a lot of people say that book should have waited as well. Well, I have mixed opinions on that, but I have great respect for Bob Gates. Yes, I do, too. I do, too. So what do you personally ex- expect to get out of this lawsuit well, we are not asking for any money or any damages. Do I feel I've been damaged? Of course I have. Am I asking for money? I, I wouldn't accept it. Uh, I have not done anything to capitalize upon this. We've asked for two things only. Number one, 
we have asked for an injunction. That means that the court is going to legally stop him if we win. And by the way, I want to clarify that. It means that if we win in district court and then they appeal it, and we expect that we'll win somewhere in September, if we win and then they appeal it, they during the time, which will be months and months before they appeal it, the employer mandate will be in full force and effect, and them appealing it does not retroactively undo that. And we have a very, very high win chance. The second thing that we've asked for is called the declaratory action, and a deck action basically means that we're asking the court, meaning the judge of the court, to declare that this was a knowingly unconstitutional maneuver, and uh, that carries with it certain penalties, and I don't want to say the I word, but I'm sure someone in Congress might bring it up. That's not my objective. My objective is to stop a tyrant from doing something that is illegal and unconstitutional. Our guest by phone is Dr. Larry Kawa, talking about his lawsuit against Obamacare. Uh, Doctor, something that I noticed, to change this up to you just a little bit, an article you wrote this morning, I just caught the tail end of it, and I didn't realize this, you said that 89% of the people that have signed up for Obamacare already have insurance? That is according to the Wall Street Journal and the McKinsey Report, uh, which is a very high-end report that was done that shows that that is correct. So let me put it this way. One for every one person that got insurance through through Obamacare, insurance or Medicaid, and by the way, the vast majority of them were not insurance; they were just more people on Medicaid. For every one person that picked up insurance or Medicaid, thirty people who previously had insurance lost their insurance. And here's how I got there: you had eighty nine percent of two million that picked up insurance that had it previously, meaning only two hundred thousand did not. So two hundred thousand people picked up insurance or Medicaid. Six million people lost their insurance. Jeez. So six million is 30 times 200,000. Yeah, this has been... So the law was there to insure the uninsured, and instead it uninsured the insured. It did the opposite. 30 times over. And, and that discontinues. And as I said in the previous segment, that um, in, in California, covered California, about 360,000 people signed up. 320,000 were Medi-Cal, which is the same as Medicaid. The other, right. the other twenty to forty thousand are getting subsidies, and in two years the federal subsidies are going to run out. And I don't know what the state of California is going to do, or any of the other states that participate in this fiasco of a law. Well, look what's happening with Calpers, your California pension fund. I mean, they're way in the hole, but the legislatures don't understand the rule of holes. When you're in one, stop digging. The <laughs> lifeguards make a hundred thousand dollars, you know, and getting a pension of eighty percent and retiring, and you know, they're fifty years old and getting an 80% pension of a $100,000 annual salary. And the, and the more overarching principle is you can't give away what you don't have, and they continue to do so. Yeah, it's incredible. You know, and, and I'm surprised that I, I think personally that what you're doing and what the 16 other people that are suing the, the government are doing is really what's going to bring down Obamacare because it'll be hacked away a little bit at a time. Do you see it that way? Uh, I I do see it as being something which will, at the very least, be a pebble in the shoe for the president overall. From the perspective of our lawsuit, yes, I do see it as something that could take down the entire law. There are only two cases that I feel are in that position, ours and Halbig versus Sebelius, which involves six states. And now, bear in mind what I said earlier, we are the only one case that is trying to stop the illegal waivers, uh, not just the employer mandate. There have been 15 others. Ours is on the employer mandate which is by far the largest of the illegal waivers. Uh, there have been 70 cases filed on Obamacare. Most of them have already you know, been finished. Uh, many of them are on the contraceptive mandate. Halbig versus Sebelius is on the, uh, the word state, saying that only uh, state-funded plans can get subsidies. 14 plans are state-funded, and 36 of them are either federal or federally-assisted funded. And Judge Paul Friedman in district court has dismissed their case and they are going to appeal it just as we are in the same process ourselves. And, you know, appeals are common. You have a much higher level of, uh, you know, of of getting success at the appeal level than at the district court level statistically. Dr. Rada, time. Thank you so much for the time. Thanks for the opportunity. We'll be back in 167 hours on Taking Care of Business on Current Radio News Talk 1180.